Hello. Hello, beautiful people. Welcome, welcome back to another video. Video, video. So today you can see the setup is different. My light broke, so I'm probably gonna order one tonight or tomorrow. But we have to kind of do with this kind of bad lighting. So sorry. Okay, well, um, today I'm going to read further in this book. And I was at page 31. The three C's of transformation. Community, consistency, and coaching. Coaching. We live in a world where experts and information are easily accessible online. Start by looking for widely available resources to help you with this issue. Find a book, podcast, course, friend, professional, TED talk, masterclass, or online video to help you. You'll find that most of these resources will help you break your goal into achievable smaller steps bringing a challenge that once seems insurmountable into focus. Consistency. Use the information you have gathered to make a plan for how to address the issues in an ongoing way. Set a goal for the year's end. This goal should be tied to action items, not achievements. That is, your goal shouldn't be make a million dollars, it should be committing to an ongoing effort that will help you grow in this area. Community. Look for a community that might help support your efforts. There are online and local support groups for everything under the sun. Find one where there is a mix of people who are in the same position you are in. People who are in the process of making changes and people who have some measure of success in transforming their lives in the way you wish to. Decide whether you prefer a community that is motivational, informational, or a mix of two. Who knows? You might meet your future partner there. Research shows that not only high self-esteem creates a more satisfying work life and better physical and psychological health, but it predicts better and more satisfying romantic relationships. You may be wondering, couldn't it be the other way around? Wouldn't having a great relationship boost my self-esteem? It's plausible, but the research says otherwise. In fact, when people with high self-esteem had a relationship that went on the rocks, their self-esteem was unaffected. They did not view the level of happiness in their relationship as a direct reflection of their self-worth. The Rewards of Solitude once you're spending productive time in solitude, you begin to know your own personality, values, and goals. During this process, you develop qualities that prepare you for love at every stage of a relationship in several ways. One mind. We develop the ability to see and know ourselves without the influence of another mind. Frida Kahlo said, I paint self-portraits because I am so often alone. What is a self-portrait? but a study of oneself, an attempt to visually portray self-awareness. What is a self-portrait, but a study of oneself, an attempt to visually portray self-awareness? Solitude. Solitude allows us to understand our own complexity. We become students of ourselves. In our first apartment, my friend Mari and her roommate had an occasional problem with huge flying water bugs. I absolutely could not handle it, Mari confesses. Luckily, my roommate Yvonne was a champion water bug slayer. If I came home to one, I just went out to get a drink and wait for Yvonne. But then Yvonne went away for the weekend, and on a Friday, the first day of her solo weekend, Mari came home to find a water bug in her room, on her pillow. I called Yvonne in panic. She told me to whack it, but I just couldn't. So I sat there and stared at the water bug for a long time. I thought about how unfair it was that I should hate it so much 
when I love butterflies, and then I open the window and use the broom to gently usher it out into the world. This was a small moment with a small creature, but Mari learned something about herself that she never would have if she continued to let Yvonne handle the problem for her. When we're alone, we fully rely on ourselves, figure out what we care about, and learn who we are. We learn to navigate challenges on our own. We can, of course, welcome help if it comes along, but we don't expect or depend on it. As those of you who read my first book, Think Like a Monk, may remember one of those texts I refer to most frequently is the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita, part of the Marabharata, which was written nearly 3000 years ago. The Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue between a warrior, Aruna, and the god Krishna on the eve of a battle. This may sound like it has much to offer modern humanity. This may not sound like much to offer modern humanity. But the Bhagavad Gita is the closest thing the Vedas have to a self-help book. Krishna says, The senses are so strong and impetuous, O Aryuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind even of a man of discrimination, who is endeavoring to control them. In other words, if we're not careful, we can be attracted to something superficial or inauthentic. We have to train ourselves not to instantly like and trust the most attractive person in the room without remembering that we don't know this person and understand them. Solitude helps us master the senses, the mind, because in solitude, We're only dealing with one mind, one set of thoughts. These days our senses are constantly overstimulated, not just by people, but by all the unfiltered information that bombard us. Everything competes for our attention, and admit the noise we have no chance to identify what's important. They say love is blind, because when we are overwhelmed by sensory stimulation, we can't see clearly. The senses attract us to the newest, nicest, shiniest thing without giving a chance to reflect before we make decisions. Our senses don't make the best decisions. The Bhagavad Gita says a strong wind sweeps away a boat on the water. Even one of the roaming senses on which the mind focus can carry away a man's intelligence. There is nothing wrong with attraction but we are easily carried away by what looks appealing, feels good, or sounds right. In solitude, we learn to create space between sensory simulation and decision-making. If we are constantly looking for love and constantly focused on our partner, we will be distracted from the vital work of understanding ourselves. If we don't understand ourselves, we risk taking on the tastes and values of our partner. Their vision becomes our vision. We might choose to sign on to someone's vision because we admire it. Someone might be a skilled cook whose tutelage and gratefully accept. But we don't want to mold ourselves to someone else simply because we don't know ourselves. I've had too many clients who don't realize until 20 years into their relationship, a relationship that they have lost touch with themselves because they have outsourced who they are. We can integrate our partner's taste with confidence and autonomy if we bring our own to the table. Through choices we make in solitude, we set our own standards. Through choices we make in solitude, we set our own standard of how we want to live and love and be loved. With the space to write our narrative from our own point of view, we gradually overcome the influences of movies books, our partners, our caregivers, model, or our partner's wishes. We clarify our vision of love. Solitude helps you recognize that there is a you before a you during, and a you after, after every relationship. Forgiving your own way, even when you have company and love. 
then when our narrative intersects someone else's, we don't make choices based on our infatuation or follow someone else's vision of love or passionately let things play out without knowing what we want. Instead, we gradually express the standard we have developed to see how it fits with theirs. And when we're in solitude again, we reflect and evolve.